Hi, I'm Katie Scholl, and I'm here for one final week of the online Bible study with Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. And this week, we discuss the resurrection of Jesus. And I was admittedly intimidated about teaching this week. I considered just recording, Jesus arose, he arose from the grave just as he said he would, and death is conquered. God wins. End of story. Have a great week. I'm kidding, of course. Only kidding. Uh, while that is the story, there is so much more we both need to hear and love to hear in this week of remembrance. Today, we look at Paul's defense of the resurrection to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, great is your name, both here and in heaven. This week, as we remember when darkness and light collided with light emerging victorious, help us to remember this truth. Help us to find grounding in this truth when we feel carried away by the violent winds of darkness shaping and disrupting our world. We take comfort in the victory of the resurrection and in your unchanging love. In Jesus' name we praise and ask these things. Amen. Let's go ahead and read the passage together. It's, it's a mouthful, so bear with me. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read verses 12 to 24 and then 51 to 57. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human, the resurrection of the dead has also come through through a human. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in its own order, Christ the first fruits. Then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. Look, I will tell you a mystery, verse 51. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As I sat with my coffee in my spot on the living room sofa this morning before the house was awake, I gave thanks for the sense of home that is now present in my life. Not just because I have a home I love and people in my world that contribute to that sense of home. Because the thought of feeling at home in another place feels sort of impossible right now. But I gave thanks because there was a time in my younger life when I didn't have that sense of home. I experienced a sense of homelessness, so to speak. I was drifting around without much stability. It wasn't wild and unruly, maybe in comparison to now, but I was untethered and I wasn't really growing spiritually. When I graduated from high school 
Uh, my parents sold the home I grew up in, and while I was away at school, they relocated to the community where my stepdad pastored a church. In the home they built, the place that would be my room was not finished with the initial construction. So I didn't have the going home on the weekends experience many of my college peers had. And admittedly, that was very painful for me. I drifted around. I stayed with a family I nannied for, my grandparents, and occasionally my dad. And I would do that on holidays and when dorm life got too stressful or when apartment life with three roommates proved to be a bad fit for me. So don't get me wrong, I had a firm foundation growing up. And those first couple of years of independence left me feeling like someone had stolen it right out from under me and everything was out of sorts as a result. I lacked belonging and purpose and I missed the sense of coming home to a safe place. You know, hopefully, that place that is unchanged, that has a familiar smell, where the couch cushion you always choose fits you just right, and where the people understand you without a word. Eventually, my circumstances allowed me to be more rooted, healthy, and focused on what was important. But again, I experienced this sort of homelessness in another season of life. And in some ways, I've learned, losing the sense of home The sense of space and place was one of the more painful parts of that season that thankfully passed. And as it passed, it revealed a new sense of aliveness, home, and hope, just as I had experienced previously. In both times, what helped me through the season of disorientation was to ground myself in what I could know to be true, right, and stable. Both times, I went back to the basics in my relationship with Jesus. It was as if I said, let me introduce myself, Jesus, because I seem to have forgotten who I am. Or maybe I've just forgotten who you are and how that shapes who I am. Can you help me? The church at Corinth was a wild and unruly congregation in a wild and unruly city. The Christians were not known for their spiritual depth. As a result, Paul is trying to nail down some of the basic truths about Jesus and his way. The Corinthians needed to revisit the essentials, just as I did many years ago, and I'm sure many of us do from time to time. In a world where everything once felt stable but is now loosed, It's crucial we Christians remember Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as we're told in Hebrews 13. The ground on which we stand in this world is often like quicksand or leaves us feeling like someone stole the foundation out from under us and everything is amiss. And in these times, it is comforting to remember there is a rock, one in whom we can always find our home. And his name is Jesus, the resurrected Lord. This truth will never change. This truth will never unexpectedly relocate. And this truth transcends all circumstances. All of 1 Corinthians is a discussion and defense of the resurrection. But our focus is on verses 12 to 24 and 51 to 57, in which Paul makes three points. What happens if Christ has not been raised in verses 12 to 19? What happens because Christ has been raised in 20 to 24 and the victory that is ours because of the resurrection in 51 to 57? There were some people in Corinth who scoffed at the idea that a dead person could come back to life. They thought the Christian's claim about Jesus was preposterous. And in verses 12 to 19, Paul takes on these scoffers and reminds the Corinthian Christians what is at stake if Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, all Christian preaching is for nothing. In verses 14 to 15, he says, Our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ. Christ. 
Paul and other Christians had bet their lives on this truth of the resurrection. And if this wasn't true, they were the biggest fools in history. If Christ had not been raised, there is no forgiveness of sins. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, he says in verse 17. If Christ remained the victim of sin and death, he couldn't have redeemed us from their power. A dead Christ is not a deliverer. And Paul knew this firsthand as he met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus and had his life forever changed. If Christ had not been raised, our hope is destroyed. Then those who have also then those also who have died in Christ have perished. Verse 18. The resurrection of Jesus makes a way for the resurrection of all those who have died in him. Paul says in verse 32, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Without resurrection, meaning and hope are replaced by emptiness and despair. If Christ had not been raised, his sacrifice had no meaning. If there was no resurrection, then Jesus' death on the cross was in vain, and the promises he had made about his resurrection are not true. As a result, those who believe such things are to be pitied and scoffed at. The truth of the resurrection validates our faith and gives us hope that is not in vain. For Paul, it is clear that the resurrection was the heart of the gospel. In a literal sense, if the heart stops working, we we die. The, The other body parts can't function without the heart's work. So when the heart goes, everything else goes too. And that's how Paul and the other New Testament writers viewed the resurrection. It's the one truth on which all the others depend. In verse 20, Paul shifts his focus to what has happened now that Christ has been raised from the dead. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead in verse 24. Then he gives an illustration that is foreign to us today, but had relevance then. Paul describes Christ as the first fruits of those who have died in verse 24. The first fruits refer to a practice described in Leviticus for growing, harvesting, and grinding grain and offering it to the Lord. The first portion of grain to make it through this process was called the first fruits. The making and offering of these first fruits was a sign of good things to come because they could then sell all the subsequent fruits. They were a cause. The first fruits were a cause for expectation and joy. They were a sign of hope. Paul uses the analogy of first fruits to depict the good things yet to come because Christ was raised from the dead. His resurrection was like the first fruits of the harvest, a precursor to wonderful things in the future. In verses 22 to 24, Paul discusses what will happen because of the resurrection of Christ. First, all will be made alive in Christ. Second, at Christ's coming, those who belong to him will be welcomed. And third, Christ will hand over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler, authority, and power. Paul's not necessarily writing a literal timeline or science, it's poetry. It is Paul's attempt to show what a remarkable influence the resurrection has on human history. Christ's resurrection unlocked a chain of events that will lead to the greatest climax of any story ever written. Jesus' resurrection was a cosmic event that changed the course of time, and it ought to fill us with hope and joy. In verses 51 to 57, Paul rejoices that death has been swallowed up in victory. All of us who face death do so with a set of predictable emotions. When we think about death, there are three words that probably come to mind for many of us. Death is swallowed up in certainty. We all know it's coming. Death is swallowed up in mystery. We know it will happen, but don't often know what that entails. And finally, death is swallowed up in fear. Because death is so certain and so mysterious, it's also frightening. It is a fear of the unknown, a fear of entering something completely foreign to us. And in verses 51 to 57, Paul gives us another word to add to our list. Death is swallowed up in victory. In place of the word dead, Paul says those who know Christ will be changed in verse 52. I'm going to read uh, 52 to 54 for you. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, 
For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Paul suggests death is not an end, but a transition. Death is not extinction, it's transformation. This is the truth we Christians celebrate every Easter. We proclaim to ourselves and to the world that while the words certainty, mystery, and fear do apply to death, the resurrection of Jesus adds a fourth word to that list, victory. Paul concludes his treatise on death and resurrection by saying, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the next verse, theology is changed to challenge and motivation in 58. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul urges us to translate the joy and victory of the resurrection into steadfast labor for the Lord. May that be true for each of us as we ground ourselves in the truth of the resurrection this Easter. Let's pray. God, help us never to take the resurrection of Jesus for granted. We thank you that because of his resurrection, We can dare to believe that death has been swallowed up in victory. We want to be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. And it is in his name and spirit we pray on this day. Amen. Thank you. Happy Easter. And I hope you have a great week.